Hi, Tech. It's good to see you. How would you like to help me give Paul here some tips on the new 1963 heaters? Sure would, Chet. I'm always glad to help our technicians learn more about their work. Where do you want to start, Paul? Let's begin with the 63 Valiant and Dart heater. It's easy to see it's an all-new design, but I'd like to know more about how it works. We can help you there. The heater for the Valiant and the Dart is the air mixing type. This simply means that outlet air temperature is controlled by blending hot and cold air in the heater housing instead of modulating the water flow through the heater core. The doors or deflectors that control airflow for heating and defrosting are operated mechanically by cables from three heater control knobs. There are no vacuum actuators on this heater. Summer ventilation is provided by hand-operated doors in the fresh air ducts under the instrument panel. But in winter, both ventilation doors must be closed tightly to prevent cold air leaks. Now, let's see how the heater and blower control knob operates. Pulling out the knob opens the air door in the right-hand fresh air duct to admit air to the heater. Turning the knob clockwise turns on the heater blower. What about adjusting the cable to the air door, Chet? Good question, Paul. It's a simple but important adjustment. If for any reason the cable's not adjusted properly, the air door could be held slightly open when it's supposed to be closed. This can cause a rather loud fluttering noise under certain conditions. If you don't know about this, you could have a real picnic trying to track down the noise. To adjust the cable, first remove the glove box to get at the cable adjustment point. Disconnect the cable mounting clip on the heater housing, but leave the cable attached to the air door shaft. Be sure the control knobs pushed all the way in. Then turn the air door shaft counterclockwise as far as it will go and hold it there while you connect the cable mounting clip. That adjustment's no problem, Chet. Now, are there any tips on operating the heater and blower control that I should know about? There's only one that I can think of. If an owner turns the blower on with the heater knob in, the blower will cause a vacuum in the housing that will tend to hold the air door shut. Then it takes a pretty strong pull on the knob to open the door, and the owner may think that he has a bind in the cable or linkage. Oh, I see. If the owner remembers to pull the heater and blower control knob out before he turns it to start the blower, he won't have any trouble pulling the knob out, correct? You're right, Paul. And that covers the heater and blower control. Now, let's consider the temperature control knob, the center knob in the heater control panel. As you can see, this knob controls the temperature door. The position of the door determines how much cold air will be mixed with the heated air from the heater core before it reaches the blower. That explains why heater output temperature responds immediately when the temperature control knob is moved. I suppose the adjustment of the temperature control cable is important, too. You bet it is. I'd say it's the most important one of the lot. Chet knows what he's talking about, Paul. If the temperature control cable adjustment is off in one direction, the temperature door won't close completely in the high heat position. Then you'll never get the maximum heater output temperature because some cold air will always flow past the door directly to the blower, cooling the heated air. If the cable adjustment's off in the other direction, the temperature door won't close completely in the off position, so that some warm air will be discharged when the heater is being used for summer ventilation. Right. And either of these two conditions is sure to result in an unhappy customer. To adjust the temperature control cable, disconnect the cable mounting clip on the heater housing. Don't remove the cable from the temperature door shaft, though. Make certain the temperature control knobs pushed in then turn the temperature door shaft as far as it will go in a clockwise direction and hold it there while you connect the clip. Okay, I got that. Now, is there anything unusual about the defroster control? No, it's also a simple cable control door like the other two controls. When the defroster knob on the right side of the heater control panel is pulled full out, it delivers maximum defrosting. When it's all the way in, a slight amount of air still flows up the defroster ducts to the windshield. And by using intermediate knob settings, the driver can choose just the amount of defrosting he wants. 
To adjust the defroster cable, disconnect the cable mounting clip and push the defroster knob in. Then, turn the defroster door shaft clockwise as far as it will go and hold it there while you connect the clip. It's not necessary to remove the glove box to make this adjustment. And that's the dope on the three control knobs and how to adjust the control cables, Paul. Well, there's certainly no problems there. Now, have you got any more good service tips on this heater? Yes, I've got a few suggestions, Paul. First of all, since you must remove the heater assembly from the car to remove the heater core or blower motor for service, here's a tip to remember if you've loosened or moved the blower on the motor shaft. Normally, there should be between 15 30 seconds and one half of an inch of clearance between the blower and the motor mounting plate. But this dimension varies with individual heaters. So after you've installed the motor and blower in the heater housing, but before you put the heater back in the car, hook jumper wires to the motor and run it to be sure there's no interference between the blower and the housing. When you install the heater, be sure you don't get the hoses reversed. The hot water hose from the cylinder head should be attached to the heater tube closest to the blower motor. The return hose that leads to the water pump should be attached to the heater tube farthest from the blower motor. Well, Paul, that's all I've got on the new Dart and Valiant heaters. Thanks, Chet. I know these tips will come in handy later on. Now, let's discuss the Dodge and Plymouth heater next. Okay. First, I'm sure you've noticed that the heater in the Dodge and Plymouth is similar to last year's heater. Yes, I have, and that brings up a question. Does this mean that the things I've learned about the 62 Plymouth and Dart heater also apply to the 63 Plymouth and Dodge? They should, Paul. Of course, it depends just what you've learned. On poor heating complaints, I always check door weather seals and the firewall for cold air leaks. That's the first step in making sure the complaint actually originates with a heater and not somewhere else. I also check the thermostat to be certain it's in good working order, and I make sure the thermostat's 180 degree one. It's really surprising how many owners return from summer vacation trips with 160 degree thermostats. I examine the cooling system to be sure it's not leaking, and I check the condition of all the hoses too. While I'm at it, I make sure the heater hoses aren't reversed. Also, I see if the owner's using permanent type antifreeze, and I make sure the cooling system's full. If the coolant level is low, circulation through the heater core will be reduced and heater output will suffer. Of course, I'm sure you both realize that those are basic points any technician should know by heart. But the point we have to consider right now is the point on this phonograph needle. Okay, you two heater experts. Besides making sure the entire cooling system's in good shape, the thermostat's okay, the heater hoses aren't reversed, and checking for cold air leaks, what other heater service tips do you have? Here's one on heater controls. If you don't get full heat when the temperature selector lever is in the full warm position, a temperature control cable adjustment may be all that's needed. This is also true if you get heat when the lever is in the off position. That's right, Tech. In either condition, the trouble's due to the temperature selector lever hitting one end of its slot before the valve is fully opened or closed. And here's a point I've learned through long experience. The control valve itself practically never fails because there's very little that can go wrong with it. In just about every case, proper adjustment of the cable will correct the trouble. Of course, you should also check the cable for sharp bends and kinks. I know why the temperature control cable adjustment's so important, all right, but what if the cable's okay and you still don't get satisfactory heating? A cold air leak in the heater itself is another possibility. Cold air leaks on the passenger side of the front seat, for example, can be caused by the rubber grommet for the blower motor wire being out of place. If you find this, just work the grommet back into place using needle nose pliers. Cold air leaks on the right side can also come from the flexible duct between the air inlet and the blower motor housing if it's not properly fitted and tightened at both ends. 
Don't forget to look under the heater to be sure the front edge of the carpet or floor mat is fitted under the retainer. If it's out of place, it could keep the deflector from going completely into the heat position. Then cold air from the fresh air inlet could flow directly into the passenger compartment. Sometimes, an air leak at the deflector occurs when the actuator linkage is out of adjustment so that it doesn't go over center to apply enough tension to compress the deflector seal. To adjust the linkage, make sure the linkage is in the closed position by starting the engine and pushing the heat button. After stopping the engine, loosen the lever pivot screw slightly, just enough so that it can be moved sideways in the pivot bracket. Then, while pushing up on the deflector to ensure a good seal, twist the lever counterclockwise and toward the rear of the car. Hold the parts firmly in those positions and tighten the pivot screw. But supposing the cold air leak persists even after you've made the actuator linkage adjustment, what then? It's possible that the cold air is leaking past the deflector seal. You can check the seal by removing the blower and holding a light inside the heater housing. Look for light leaking out past the seal when the deflector is in the heat position. There should be no leaks all along the full length of the deflector seals. However, don't be concerned if a little light shines through beyond the ends of the seals. Just be sure you find and correct any big leaks that will cut down heater output. While you're checking that area, be sure the round seal at each end of the deflector shaft is doing its job too. A leak at either of these seals could aim a jet of cold air right down on somebody's feet, you know. If you do find a leak, I suppose the next thing to do is to remove the deflector and straighten out or replace the leaking seal. Right, Paul. And it's not hard to remove and install the deflector without taking the heater housing out of the car. Well, Chet, those tips should help to correct cold air leaks in Dodge and Plymouth heaters. But what about other service problems, like a lack of airflow through the defroster vents? or no heated air being discharged at floor level, for example. Many air distribution problems can be traced to some part of the vacuum actuating system that controls the deflectors. The trouble could be in the push button switch, the vacuum hoses, or in the actuator itself. Vacuum hoses to the actuators are color coded with a red or white stripe. Always remember that the red striped hose is attached to the rod side of every actuator. Uh, hold it, Chet. There's one exception to that rule. On the Chrysler, Dodge 880, and Imperial air conditioners, the hoses for the bypass door actuator on the engine side of the unit are attached in the opposite order. The white striped hose goes to the rod side of the actuator, while the red striped hose goes to the other side. Tex right, Paul, don't forget that one exception when you apply the red to rod rule. And when you check the hose connections, also make sure the hoses aren't pinched or twisted. To disconnect a vacuum hose, catch a thin bladed tool over the end of the hose and work it off the fitting, twisting it a little as it moves off. And you'll find it's easier to install the hose if you lubricate the fitting with clean water. When past models come in for winterizing, take a moment to lubricate every vacuum actuator rod with silicone grease. Apply just enough to keep the rod from binding in the actuator seal. Be sure to wipe away the excess to keep dirt from gathering on the rod. Occasionally, if the rod isn't lubricated, it might bind and pull the seal right out of the actuator when vacuum is applied. If this happens, moisten the rim of the seal with clean water and press it back in place after lubricating the rod. Okay, but suppose the vacuum hoses are connected correctly and the actuator rod isn't binding, yet the deflector in question still won't operate right. What then? Most likely it's either a ruptured diaphragm in the actuator or a leaking vacuum hose. To test for a ruptured diaphragm, remove both vacuum hoses from the actuator and place your fingers over the ends of both fittings. Try to move the actuator rod. If it moves when both vacuum chambers are sealed off, the diaphragm is probably leaking and the actuator assembly should be replaced. If the actuator is okay, I suppose the next step is to check for a leak in the vacuum lines. That's right, Paul. And if you find a leak, 
but the hose is in good shape otherwise, just cut the faulty spot out and splice the hose with copper tubing. Don't overlook the chance that the deflector itself might be binding either. And if you follow all these suggestions, you'll be able to clear up most any air distribution problem. Those are all fine tips, but you know, there's one Dodge and Plymouth heater we've been forgetting about. I mean the heater that's a part of the air conditioning unit for those cars. Glad you brought that up, Paul. I've got some suggestions for those units, too. Many of the points we've mentioned for the standard heaters also pertain to the air conditioning units. For example, being sure the owner knows how to operate his equipment properly, plus looking for cold air leaks, and checking the condition of the entire vacuum actuating system. Current Dodge and Plymouth air conditioning units have a wire carpet retainer to prevent the front edge of the carpet from curling up and blocking off the warm air outlets. It's a good idea to install this retainer on 62 units, too. A cold air leak into the passenger compartment could occur if the recirculating door doesn't close completely when the heater's turned on. You're right, Tech. If this happens, it's necessary to remove the flexible duct and adjust the length of the fresh air door length so that the recirculating door is held tightly closed when the fresh air door is wide open against its stop. Uh, don't forget to take steps to make sure the blower won't run when the duct is removed. In addition, you'll have to adjust the travel adjustment screw if either door doesn't close tightly when the engine's running and the blower switch is operated in both the fresh air and recirculating positions. Yes, that's an important point. If you've determined that the unit's not giving enough heat, check the temperature control cable adjustment first. When the adjustment's correct, both ends of the cable housing will extend beyond the mounting clips, about five thirty seconds of an inch. Another possible cause of insufficient heat that's quickly checked is a vacuum leak at the fitting on the top of the water flow valve. In fact, a vacuum leak anywhere in the temperature control system will reduce the heat output of the air conditioner. Another component of the temperature control system that should be checked is the temperature selector switch. You'll need a vacuum pump and gauge to do this. If the switch leaks or needs adjustment, heat output will be low. If there's no heat or heat output is erratic, test the calibration and check valve operation of the heater thermostat. Be sure to use a test hose of the specified length with a vacuum pump and gauge. This test and the tests for the temperature selector switch are described in detail in the reference book for this session. If the heater hoses are reversed, fluctuating air outlet temperatures without a complete loss of heat could result. You might also get unusually high heater core temperatures for low selector lever positions with this condition. And that just about covers the Dodge and Plymouth heater service story. Fine, Chet. I appreciate those tips. But what about the custom 880 heaters and the Chrysler and Imperial heaters, too? Basically, they're the same as last year. But what we said about the Dodge and Plymouth heaters generally holds true for them, too. You know, things like heater hose routing, temperature cable adjustments, vacuum actuator system diagnosis, and so on. Well, I sure learned a lot from you two guys today. Now I guess I better start using what I've learned to keep our service customers comfortable this winter. That's the spirit, Paul. Keeping your customers comfortable is one good way to keep your customers, you know. And that's worth remembering. Our dealership's reputation for service is made by the way we handle every job. To our customers, there's no such thing as a small service problem. They're all important.